Hey everybody, I'm Anne Marie Fred. The talk I'm going to give today is about building a better software supply chain. So I'm going to share some of the surprising lessons that we learned as we were building Complex and the Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline product. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I worked for IBM for many years and Red Hat for the past few. Um, I'm a senior principal software engineer and an architect, and I'm in the developer tools group there. And my background was originally as a programmer, and then I went into DevOps for like 10 years, probably about five years of application security. And I also worked a lot with high availability and disaster recovery, cloud architecture and deployments. And recently I've been working more on artificial intelligence. So today what I'm going to cover is a little bit of history and background information about Conflux, some of the key features just so you understand how it works. And then I'll get right into things that we learned the hard way, both functional problems and non-functional. And key takeaways if you're going to be building a um, product build system yourself. Uh, one thing, sometimes enterprises like to keep their software supply chain practices secret. They think you might get security by obscurity. If we don't tell people how we build our software, then it'll be harder for them to hack and to open source intelligence. But that doesn't work in the long term, right? It's better to have eyes on the process to, so other people can help us make it better. And the Conflux project is publicly available and open source and has been from the beginning. So my goal here is just to make sure that we give each other every advantage in the security race. A little bit of history. So at the end of 2021 and into 2022, we started two things around the same time. One was an internal project to modernize and simplify our internal build systems at Red Hat. We had more than 250 build servers and more than 1,000 host systems, uh, build services, sorry, and 1,000 host systems. And it was way too complex, too much for any one person to understand. Secondly, around the same time, we started a product where we wanted to make it easier for our customers to build their own software more securely. And that project had the goal of five clicks in five minutes to get your build done. In 2023, we merged these two programs into one, the um, internal uh, project and the external product, and we named that Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline. And we made a tech preview of that made available about a year ago in May of 2023. Around in that summer, we also passed our internal quality and security reviews, and our first internal adopters started to use the system in production. Then in 2024, we decided that we wanted to kick off an open source community project around it, which we named Conflux. And we also named our own internal deployment of that project Conflux. And then we rebuilt the product, Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline, from a software as a service to an on-premises product. Because all of our actual customers were trying the service and saying, great, now can I run it myself? <laughs> So we had a lot of goals for our build system. Like I mentioned before, we wanted to make it less complex to simplify the maintenance and reduce the costs. We wanted to simplify and automate more of our release process because there was still quite a bit of that was, that was manual. And one of the goals there was to allow for fast, frequent releases, especially for software as a service. We wanted to be able to do daily releases if we wanted to, right, or even multiple times per day. We also wanted it to make it easier for people to onboard to the system and we wanted to use what we sell to make it better for everybody. And along the way, we're also going to improve open source projects, including Tekton, Argo CD, and a bunch of security command line tools. We also wanted to improve our own software supply chain security. Um, a big part of this is improving the data that we were able to collect for attestation, which is sort of like what has happened during your build pro process. Provenance, where did everything in your build come from? and software bill of materials. We wanted to meet SALSA level three uh, requirements, which is the supply chain levels for so software artifacts. If you're interested in that, you can go look that up. As well as NIST security requirements and Red Hat's own internal security requirements. So for the features, I'm gonna show you a quick demo because Burr can explain this in four minutes faster than I can. I'm gonna hit create application. I'm going to paste in the URL for my Git repository. You can see it right there. And I'm going to hit import code. So with just a few simple clicks, we're going to identify what that application looks like. You can see here, we see that it's a Spring Boot application. 
but it could also have been Quarkus, it could have been Node, it could have been Python, Go, or even anything with a Docker file. And we have lots of appropriate defaults, including a default Docker file, uh, as well as you know things like ports, CPU, memory. I'm going to just leave all those defaults in place and hit Create Application. So in just a few clicks, I have now onboarded that application from the Git repository that had no Docker file inside it, no YAMLs inside it, and I have onboarded it to a full software supply chain focus CI/CD process that includes a nice build, and we can go look at the pipeline execution here, and we can go see that it's running through this series of steps, and it has this out-of-the-box, pre-opinionated uh, pipeline that is actually part of the Red Hat productization system. So we actually had to rebuild our internal container engine, container image productization engine, and we have done so now, and we're working on gaining our internal customers, but we wanted to make this visible to our external customers as of today. So now you can kind of see that we have uh, this pipeline running. It's going to do a, a clone repository. Prefetch dependencies allows you to do a network isolated build or what's known as a hermetic build. It's going to build the container, produce an SBOM. As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and fast forward at this point to show you what it looks like when it's finished. So I'm going to jump all the way over here to where I can upgrade that pipeline now. So it, you can see that this one's finished. It did the build container and produced the software build materials. And it also has a show summary. But it skipped these steps in the middle. And I'm showing this on purpose because we have a fast onboarding process. We want to make it super uh, point and click and super painless. But you can then upgrade that experience to the more software supply chain oriented pipeline with a few simple clicks. So let's go in there now and say, I want to go to my partner catalog. I'm going to go to components, and I want to say manage the build pipeline. And it's going to say, okay, now this is going to practice pipelines as code. I'm going to say send pull request. It's going to go out there to my GitHub repository. And you can see it failed in this case because I did not yet install the GitHub application. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say install the GitHub application. And yep, let's just say install here. I do need to log in, and we'll go ahead and log in. And there it is. If we go back over here now, we should be able to send that pull request with success. So it's going to attempt to send it one more time and see that it lands out there, and it did. Now it says, would you like to merge it? I'm going to click over there and say, yes, let's merge it. And confirm that merger. And at this point, our pipeline should be kicked off. It should be noted that there is now a Tekton folder out here that represents the YAML files for that software supply chain focused uh, Tekton chains based pipeline that we mentioned earlier. So let's actually go check it out. Let's go see if it's running and we'll go to activity and there it is. It's kicked off now. So it's going to go through that process. Let's fast forward one more time to show you what this looks like when it's completed. Also, I want to show you what it looks like if a user has customized it slightly. In this case here, you can kind of see it's gone through the build container, produced that SBOM, as I mentioned, the software build materials, but it also has done some label checking, inspection of the image, Claire scan, this is Rock CTL, which we'll talk more about in a second, but this not only looks for CVEs, but also looks for policy enforcement points. Like, do you have YAML files in that, uh, in that Git repo that's coming in? And do those um, uh, YAML files have all the appropriate settings in them? For instance, do you have uh, a deployment YAML with secrets that are exposed as environment variables, and that's a policy violation? You also have the trusted content. You saw that earlier with the recommendations. Uh, that we had earlier, but if I look at this require, uh, Rock CTL one, you can see it found a bunch of vulnerabilities. I purposely loaded in a ton of uh, ugly ones in this case, but to show you that it will find them and flag them. And of course, this build pipeline, as I mentioned, is part of the Red Hat Next Generation productization engine, and you can see what it's doing here. I'm going to hit create application. All right. So the good news is that that pipelines as code security and compliance pipeline works really well. That was the least of our troubles. <laughs> so if you ever want to get into more details on what all those steps are, check out the Conflux project. But all was not sunshine and rainbows. We learned some things the hard way. Uh, first of all, there's nothing simple about a build system, right? We had to support mono repos, hermetic builds, which is like building with no network connection, multi-architecture, Windows, Mac, AIX, Signing artifacts with the official Red Hat keys, uh, what we call enterprise contract, which is the policy engine of all the checks you have to pass before you can release anything. We had to automatically tag releases and then publish the artifacts to the right places. And eventually we had to connect to internal systems, work with our internal GitHub repos and, uh, and tracking systems. So a lot 
had to happen before our, even our first internal adopters were able to use it. So some of the functional issues. First of all, the, um, if you saw when he imported a repository, it automatically did a, a deployment. And what it was doing was generating an Argo CD-based GitOps repo in the background that you couldn't even see. It was sort of hidden from our consumers. And so the tools were trying to manage all the possibilities for an application deployment for you. But it never worked. It worked for our sample applications, but none of our real applications were able to actually deploy with what we could auto-generate. So in the end, we just had crash-looping pods, and it was just a total waste of cluster resources to even try to do that. Uh, eventually, we removed this feature from the build pipelines instead and gave teams GitOps example repositories and just let them maintain their own deployment logic. It works a lot better. The integration tests were also a problem. So the system was designed after it deployed your application to automatically run integration tests for you after uh, your application was up and running in that sandbox. But it wasn't flexible enough. Again, we had different architectures to worry about. There were different prereqs for what was needed to get the test running, uh, different test frameworks, different ways of handling errors, and you know what was an acceptable error versus not an acceptable error. So in the end, again, this had to become a separate pipeline where you could just request a test environment to your spec, deploy your own app, and then run your own tests. And we just saved the test logs for later. We also had a problem where we were kicking off way too many Tecton pipeline runs. Uh, because of this tight coupling between build, deploy, and test, every pull request kicked off the entire process. And especially for monorepos, this was a major problem because a change to one component would build and retest the entire project. And in some of our early adopters, we had more than 30 uh, different containers that were being built. And builds would just consume massive resources and time out after an hour. It was bad. So we had to refactor both the data model and the controllers to allow different phases to happen independently as needed and to provide a way to specify that you know, only a change to this part of the source code could kick off a build of this container, for example. But there are consequences when you're trying to do supply chain security if you decouple different things. So now instead of hard coding the process, we're actually doing a lot of record keeping along the way so we can look back and see what was done earlier. Uh, Tecton Chains is a, a key part of this. So it actually observes the Tecton pipelines and records what the pipelines have done in an attestation file. And then we sign that with our key. So that's like a cryptographic signing so we know that nobody has tampered with it later. Um, and then we also store the attestations and the software bill materials with the artifacts in our Quay repository and it's all signed with the Red Hat keys. In addition to all that, we have Tecton results which stores the build and test logs so we can go back and review the results later. Another problem we had that is that our release policies were initially too inflexible. So ideals versus, versus reality here. Sometimes we do need to release a container that's, that's failing a policy check to fix an even bigger problem. But our team's test pipelines were failing before they even got to the release process because of a policy failure. For example, if we have two critical or high CVEs that are reported in the same week, we might be able to fix one in one day, and the other might take us four or five days. And we don't want to have to wait five days to fix both, right? So we're going to get the fix out for one as soon as possible and then fix the other. Um, so we changed it so that the pre-release phases warn that you are currently violating the policy, but they don't break the build. And we also put a, like a formal policy exception process in place so you could get sign off that, yes, it's okay to release this uh, container with a vulnerability because it has less than it did yesterday. Uh, some non-functional requirements. One is we had to build the clusters twice by hand. So we were in a big hurry to get our first staging and production cluster set up. So we did it by hand and just documented it in like a huge you know, document. Um, but somebody accidentally exposed the Amazon uh, AWS admin key in GitHub. So they were just playing around and they did a commit and they pushed the key and it went up to, into GitHub. Within an hour, some process somewhere had found that key, scraped it, they had compromised the account, deployed a bunch of servers into it. And at that point, we decided that the account was polluted, we couldn't trust it anymore, and we had to delete everything out of it and start all over again. And we lost about a month <laughs> of work in doing that. It was really bad. We actually had to go like 
use our staging systems for a little while because people were already trying to build on there and like rebuild the production underneath it. Um, in hindsight, it would have been a lot easier to rebuild this if we would have used Terraform automation from the beginning to set up our networks and our clusters. And the next time we did it, <laughs> we did that. So now we can create new clusters whenever we need to. Um, another problem was that the pipeline runs were just too slow. We were naive in our configuration settings. And initially, we had a cluster with, I don't know, like 10 or 12 nodes, and it could only handle five concurrent pipeline runs. The sixth one would just hit the API server, and everything would slow down and crash. It was really bad. Um, we found out that we were running into CPU and memory quotas, storage limits. Like, you can only have so many uh, volumes connected to each node. And actually, API server overload, because we had controllers watching things all over. So the goal that we set is that we thought we should be able to do 100 concurrent basic pipeline runs, like the one you saw at the beginning of the demo. Those should all finish within five minutes. And we wanted to be able to do 100 concurrent full pipeline runs with all the security checks in eight minutes. We did eventually get there on one cluster. Um, one of the main things we had to do was aggressive pipeline run pruning. So these Tecton pipelines leave a lot of objects in your cluster. Um, initially, we were trying to keep like the last 10 builds, but that wasn't enough. Uh, we actually changed it so as soon as the results of the build were recorded uh, by Tecton Chains and Tecton Results, then we would delete the pipeline run right away, and that freed up a lot of cluster resources for us. And so we weren't running into those CPU and memory quotas as easily. Um, another thing we did was we went through the pipeline tasks and we reduced the CPU and memory requests for most of the tasks. So most of them only, only need like a tenth of a CPU and maybe like 50 gigs of memory, right? They don't need a lot. A few of them, like the build a tasks, actually needed a few CPUs and a big chunk of memory. So we increased those. And by tuning the Tecton pipelines, we got a great deal of speed up as well. And we actually removed CPU limits entirely because our clusters will ne were never hitting the CPU um, capacity, like we were never auto-scaling because of CPU. Uh, and there are some best practices that are out there if you want to read about it just to, that say just don't limit CPU at all. Um, so we did that. And if you want more detail on how to tune your Tecton pipelines, there is a link in uh, at the end of this slide. When you download it, you can follow up on that. Um, another thing that was a lot harder than we expected was backup and recovery. So backup's easy, but can you actually restore? Right? If you haven't tested it, the answer is no. Um, so for the databases, we use the standard database backup and restore features, and that was pretty easy. Um, and then we used Valero to back up the in-cluster data, the objects in the cluster. And it took uh, several weeks of trial and error just to learn what we should be backing up. And when we tried to restore, first of all, uh, what was happening is there were controllers that were watching for certain objects to be created in the cluster, and they would kick off the creation of more objects. And if we didn't create do the restore in the right order, we would end up with a bunch of junk data in the cluster. So it took a lot of practice to figure out how to do that in the right sequence. Another thing that I think we underestimated was how much help we would need from site reliability engineering and platform engineering to keep this complex system up. You know, your build systems really can't be down. If you can't build, you can't fix software, right? Um, so we ended up needing a few full-time platform engineers to do things like write backup and recovery code, automate the deployments with Terraform, tune the permissions, tune audit logging, do all that performance tuning for expert support anytime somebody needed like a cluster admin to help us help with something. We also needed our SRE team for infrastructure level support, um, monitoring and 24-7 coverage because we didn't have people in some of the time zones who were working on the development of this. And it took several months to train each of those teams. My rule of thumb is if you have Kubernetes clusters, you probably need platform engineers. <laughs> um, pen testing. So we're lucky. We have pen testers at Red Hat who are experts at Kubernetes and OpenShift, and they already know what to look for. Um, one thing they found within a day or two was that one key process had a bug that allowed escalation of privileges, and it was an easy fix. But if we wouldn't have done the pen testing, we wouldn't have known, right? I think they were able, able to fix it the next day. Um, we also found a denial of service vulnerability in the process that was generating the GitOps repositories. 
it was locking up the API server because it was a synchronous process that took a few minutes to run. So it, it wasn't hard to overload the API server with requests for that. So initially, we changed that process so it would run asynchronously and not lock up the a API server. And eventually, as I mentioned, because the GitOps deployments weren't working, we eventually removed that entirely. Um, another thing we spent a lot of time testing was for sandbox escapes. So for these test deployments, they get their own little namespace in the cluster. Um, we made sure that you couldn't, you know, escape from there and do any kind of privilege escalation at the system level or affect anybody in another namespace. And we also tested for arbitrary code execution, which is another, uh, probably the biggest risk of any build system. Like, nobody wants to be solar winds, right? <laughs> Um, another thing we learned um, is that the pipeline can't and shouldn't do everything. So some security checks should be done somewhere else. Um, for example, known vulnerabilities, the complex system does check for those, but we also find that developers like to use tools right in GitHub like this Pendabot and Renovate that will put up pull requests for them that they can just easily review and just hit merge. It saves them a lot of time. Uh, for linting, Things like uh, code coverage checkers, format checkers, code smells, those are better done either in the unit tests, so the problem or the, the change uh, doesn't even show up in a pull request where people are trying to review it if there's a formatting error. Um, or you can use GitHub bots to check for code smells and things like that. Um, basically, if, if you're already doing your final build pipelines, it's a little bit late to try to catch those. Uh, another thing is GitHub or GitLab settings are very important. For example, you want to make sure that you're enforcing that every code change has to have code reviews and approvals on it by trusted approvers. And also, we only want to run builds for people who are trusted committers. Some random person can't go come in and try to change our build pipeline on us, right? Um, and preventing leak secrets. Um, a very high percentage of developers, if they've been doing this long enough, have at least once checked a secret or a key into GitHub. A very high percentage. Um, we have Git pre-commit hooks that we have everybody install on their laptops, which is your first line of defense. So when you run the git commit command, it will immediately check for secrets and prevent you from even committing in the first place. That's great. Uh, we also enabled GitHub push protection, so if you manage to commit it on your laptop and then push, then it will stop it from ever actually getting saved in on the GitHub side and to their servers. So why do you need both layers? Um, well, the pre-commit hooks, what actually happened in that case was that somebody had a brand new laptop. And even though we had, you know, gone through the whole org and said, everybody make sure you have your pre-commit hooks installed, they forgot to put it on the new laptop. So it's it's just too easy to forget or to have something accidentally break your pre-commit hook, and it's not noisy when that fails. It's just a very silent failure. So uh, it's important to have both levels of protection there. And finally, uh, onboarding teams one by one just doesn't scale. So it took months to onboard our first new teams who were really on the bleeding edge, and we have so much gratitude for them for being patient with us. Uh, but then we needed to onboard hundreds of repositories in the second year, and so we couldn't handhold people like that. So, of course, we had to gradually improve our self-service documentation. Uh, pipelines as code, where you have that .tecton folder that uh, expresses the build process, is really nice because then you can find a project that's similar to yours and copy their pipeline and then just go from there to edit it. And also, we have uh, what are called software templates in our backstage portal. And what those are is like a code generation facility where it will stamp out an application, a GitHub, uh, sorry, a GitOps repository and a Tecton pipeline for you that all work from the beginning and you can just edit it from there. So um, some key takeaways. I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I'm just going to leave this slide up for people to read. And then I would love to have some questions. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Um, so I'm curious if you're going to be using this to essentially build and deploy other instances of itself. I couldn't hear you. I'm curious if you're going to be using this to build and deploy other instances of itself and how you're going to manage that. How do we do that? Okay, so we do use Conflux to build Conflux 
And uh, the way it works is that there are many controllers in the system that are containerized. And so each of those has a Tekton pipeline that is used to build it. Um, and then to deploy the system, we have two levels. Actually, I guess we have three levels. No, two. One is the Terraform automation, right? So that's actually going to set up all the networking and the clusters themselves. And then the second level is Argo CD, which is used to install all the different controllers into the cluster. So, yeah. More questions? What's, what's been the reception from teams who are onboarding and are they happy? Are they missing things about the old systems or, or what? Uh, so the two teams that we made happy first were the containerized applications. Uh, and this is much better for them. It's pretty easy to onboard. Um, and the continuous delivery products, right? Um, they didn't really have anything that served them very well. And then we next we focused on the operator builds. So that was a very complex process um, where it was a lot of manual steps. Um, so those people were certainly helped a lot. And then we started working on things like um, building the bootable containers, if you've seen that, for um, boot, Bootsy, for uh, what do you call it, Relay and things like that. Um, so all that is built with the new system as well. So basically we're just like gradually expanding uh, what we can build using this. Like we're not building Red Hat Enterprise Linux 